OK, it's 10 o'clock. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's session. Um, great that you could all come along, and I'm sure we'll have a few more people trickling in as we progress. Um, my name's Daniel Haslam, and I'm the sort of, uh, I guess, host for today um, uh, in, in charge of making sure um, all uh, all the front front up stuff looks OK. Uh, behind the scenes, we've got Heidi working his way as, away as well. So I want to say big, big thanks to Heidi before we get going. Um, and we'll, we'll, she'll chip in with a couple of things in a moment as well. So um, today's session's uh, titled Impact Evaluation Before, During and After COVID-19. And as I mentioned, my name is Daniel Haslam. I'm also joined by my colleague Francesca uh, Carlo and also uh, Hugh McLean, who, who I'll, I'll introduce um, shortly as well. So without further ado, let's make a, make a start. So to kick things off, um, just a quick view of the agenda. I'm going to run through a a few housekeeping points in a moment, um, I then give a bit of an overview of CVSL, the Centre for Voluntary Sector Leadership, if people are, are new to us and give you an overview of where we came from and what we do. And then we'll have the two main sections of the, the workshop today. The, the first is a discussion between Francesca and Hugh that I'm going to facilitate really uh, about their experiences of evaluation from the perspective of um, an academic and a, and a practitioner. And, and Francesca and Hugh have worked together quite a bit up in up in Scotland, so it should be really great to get their their perspectives. And I know um, they they have sort of different experiences of the same things, so that those different perspectives should be should be really enlightening. Then we'll go into um, um, some breakout groups, two breakout groups, and we'll have a bit of a chat about your reflections on the the, the first section, but also your own experiences um, carrying out evaluation or not, and, and reasons why. Um, the challenges you faced and, and try and work through some potential solutions. Maybe you have solutions from your own experiences that, that other people can draw from. And we'll also have a, a bit of a QA and a at the end. So if there are any overall questions, you can you can save those up. But uh, I put a note there to to make sure you use the chat box because um, that's a great way to, to get some get questions uh, and, and also just to get some general feedback as we go through the day. So that's that's the general overall plan. So I hope that's OK for everyone. So housekeeping wise, the first half of the session, which is the discussion between Hugh and Francesca, is, is being recorded. Um, you can sign out of the meeting and rejoin, I believe, um, as an anonymous user if you, if you prefer to do that, if you don't want your name attached to the recording. Um, our plans with the recording, I, I think, to host on the CVSL website, uh, which I'll, 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 I'll mention the website and give you the link later on, um, just as, as a record of the, the event, really, and for people to refer back to. Another thing is you can follow for, for all the CVSL info, you can follow the at OUBS, OU Business School uh, Twitter account. We, we tweet out a lot of the events and things that we do on there. Um, I've, I've also noted that we haven't we haven't arranged a timed in a, a specific comfort break in the program itself, but there is some time in the in the group, the breakout sessions to uh, there's a bit of flexible time there to to um, give you the opportunity to do that if you need to or, or grab a drink or whatever it might be. Um, you'll be automatically signed the groups and brought back. Heidi's, as I said, behind the scenes doing all that kind of stuff. So big thanks to Heidi. Um, and any connection issues, if you just sign back into the this main room through the link that you joined, Heidi will stay in the room and, and hopefully be able to address any, any technical issues. And we've also got a, an evaluation form for you at the end, which Heidi, I believe, has already shared in the chat. And there it is again in the chat box. Um, it'd be great if you could fill that in and we'll give you another reminder at the end as well. Um, in case you, you forget, but well, that would be fantastic. OK, so to introduce CVSL, um, the centre was the Centre for Voluntary Sector Leadership was was established in 2016. And from the beginning, the focus was on small and medium sized voluntary sector organisations. And that's um, quite broadly defined and includes um, constituted and unconstituted groups as well, uh, community groups and neighbourhood, neighbourhood groups, etc. And um, we also emphasise, try to emphasise the links that exists between practice research and teaching and learning at the Open University. And that's one of the reasons why we have events like this, where we try and get a practitioner voice with the, the academic voice um, and also inform what we do at CVSL in terms of the courses that we offer in the centre, but also more mainstream Open University learning as well. It all feeds into to that ultimately. Uh, so for more info on CVSL, you can go onto the website, the link's there for you. Um, one other thing as well to stay in touch with us, we do send out semi-regular newsletters. So if you'd like to get on the list for that, the, you can do so in the uh, evaluation form that, that Heidi shared um, 
there's, there's an option there in, to sign up. Uh, and also one of the major things that CVSL has done over the, the last several years is um, is uh, to develop and and host some leadership courses. And there are two main ones. Um, the first one is quite sort of introductory, which is about developing leadership in voluntary sector organisations. And the second is specifically about collaborative leadership. And they, they're available for free on the Open University's Open Learn platform. The link's there for you on the slide. Um, along with a, a variety of other courses that are relevant to the sector, either sector specific, voluntary sector specific, or um, just general courses that, that have, have use um, in the sector, such as um, uh, aspects of equality and diversity or um, a financial management policy, things like that. Uh, lots of stuff on Open Learn, and it's a really, really popular platform, free platform, and can feed into um, the OU's main curriculum as well if you're interested in taking things further. Um, in terms of the CVSL courses, there's been a lot of interest, particularly during COVID lockdowns and, and people wanting to find out more about um, leadership in, in the voluntary sector, uh, but also having a bit more time on their hands, I think, to, to actually sit, sit down and, and reflect on, on these kinds of issues. So that's really great. Um, I wanted to flag as well, um, as this, uh, this session today grew out of the CVSL conference from last year, 2021, uh, where Francesca also ran a session uh, on similar themes and, and people asked for of a bit of a follow up. We have our next conference on the 9th of June. So save the date. More info will be coming out about that soon. Um, and the best ways to, to stay up to date, obviously sign up to the newsletter or, or follow us on the, the OUBS account on Twitter. One other thing I wanted to mention is a project that we've worked on for a little while that has launched earlier this year with the BBC and um, involved contributions from CVSL academics. Francesca, I know, did a lot for this. I chipped in bits and bobs as well. Um, and it's a, a, a suite of resources available on the BBC website, which are focused on um, people who are learning English, and but they specifically talk about leadership and in various forms and in quite accessible and bite sized chunks as well. There's some nice, nice videos and visuals attached to them. There's a little sample there on the slide. Um, so so for people who um, are interested in, in bite sized bits of, of uh, info about leadership and different perspectives or for specifically people, if you're working with learners of English, um, it can be a really great resource. And there are a couple of links there. The first one's to the main BBC website and the second one is to um, the Open Universities. Uh, site that supports the series and there are a couple of other um, slightly longer articles on there about leadership particularly focused on, on on the pandemic on covid so another good resource for people to to get to so without further ado we'll move on to the 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 chat between Hugh and Francesca and so um first things first I, I should introduce our, our two speakers so uh, Hugh McLean is the director of Law and Healthy Options up in Scotland and has a has a broad range of experience both uh, there and in in uh, other organisations in um, delivering services and also evaluating services in different forms as well. So we're really delighted to have Hugh with us and look forward to his contribution. And then Francesca Carlo is a lecturer at the Open University in the Open University Business School and affiliated with the Centre of Voluntary Sector Leadership. And Francesca's done quite a lot of work on evaluation um, with voluntary sector organisations specifically. And um, yeah, it should be a really great discussion. How this is going to work is I'm going to prompt prompt our guests with a few questions and uh, and comments and get their their sort of responses. So to start, we'll um, start with what hopefully is a bit of an easy one. Um, and I'll, I'll come to uh, I'll come to you first, Hugh, if that's OK. So the first question is, um, give us a description of, of sort of your experience and your work, Hugh, and, and a bit of background. OK, thank you and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I was in the chemical industry, uh, but uh, my experiences with the voluntary sectors uh, it go goes back 30 years as a volunteer. Um, 1992, a group of us took over the running of a swimming pool in our local town of Oban in West Scotland. Um, and uh, over a period of six years, we developed a 2.2 million pound sports centre. We had no indoor sports facilities within 60 miles of, of the town. Um, 
so that was the first that was the first experience and once we'd done that um we realized that uh, uh, that we had a, accumulated a fair amount of knowledge and another chap who was involved uh, him and i did research into what makes community organizations successful uh, and that was across ireland and the uk uh, for carnegie uk trust and part of that we realized that uh, and we learned that 40 percent of the population have chronic conditions and that these sports facilities that we created could actually help these people um, the facilities weren't just for a uh, fit people but could be used for everybody in the community to become more active and chronic conditions can be improved or better managed by people becoming uh, more active so back uh, in 2012 we actually started uh, healthy options as we call it uh, with a 60,000 pound budget for the year one and a half employees um, uh, based on a referral system from health professionals, principally GPs at that time, but that's now expanded. Um, and this is not a support organisation, this is an organisation that actually helps people improve their health. Um, uh, we've grown from £60,000 a year to budget is now over 200000 and we've become much more professional than we were at the beginning. Um, a, so we, we help people with who have significant challenges and we've expanded it now to people who are in danger of having chronic conditions. Um, so we're, we're into the preventative uh, aspect of it. Over the years, our funders have been uh, health and social care in Scotland. Health and social care are one have been integrated um, but uh, principally funded year on year by a range of grant bodies uh, from very large amounts. Um, the, the largest we've had is 30,000 a year for three years. Um, and the smallest amounts are, are hundreds of pounds from the likes of the local Rotary Club, etc. We've also dabbled in EU funding um, I, and the that's caused more headaches. I used to have hair before I, I started getting involved with EU funding. But that's that's basically the organisation. Um, we have a, two main exercise uh, specialists um, and a range of other folk that come in as and when required. But basically, moving just from exercise, what we're about nowadays is encouraging and giving people the skills and the knowledge so that they can self-manage their health. Um, uh, and the, we have discovered that health is not something that's created within the NHS. They only patch us up when we fail um, and health is created in the community. And unless we're doing it in the community, it's not going to happen. So mm -hmm. organisations mm -hmm. like ours uh, are, uh, are the future to be honest that's where we, we see it okay yeah great great thanks you and obviously in that health context it, it creates uh challenges uh about how to assess and evaluate the the outcomes of the work that you do and interesting about the eu um the eu funding issue that's something i think we can definitely see a connection between practitioners and academics in terms of when we try and interface with the EU for funding, it can be quite tricky. So that's a definite similarity. So uh, Francesca, let, let's go to you. Um, give us a background of what, what you've, you've been doing in this area and particularly how you and Hugh came together. Yeah, hi everybody. So uh, myself and Hugh, we met each other, I think now almost nine years ago. So when I was starting my PhD uh, up in Scotland uh, with Glasgow Caledonia University. So uh, during my PhD, the idea was to uh, try to understand how to evaluate uh, community based organization, uh, uh, non profit organization and as well. Uh, in my story as well, a bit of social innovation, how to evaluate and how to understand what was their contribution to the health and well-being and to the health care. So I come across uh, LC options uh, almost, uh, yeah, I think uh, nine years ago. And I visit Oban several times uh, before starting uh, uh, officially the data collection. Uh, and uh, I found the story of Atlantis Leisure and LC option 
very interesting and very important for that kind of community and territory. So I wanted really to test some of the methods that are used in the healthcare research to test some of them and see how they've worked in going to evaluate and understand and explore the contribution of a community-based organization as LC option in the community. So my research background in this in this field started with that. And uh, yeah, so I think I would stop here for now, but it has been a great travel, I think, with uh, Hyoga and LC options during my PhD, but as well the opportunity to reflect on that afterwards. Mm. Yeah, so so I get the reasons for, I guess, the, the origin of you wanting to do the work was, was general interest in, in um, the subject area, but also quite a sort of instrumental one in doing your PhD and doing your academic research and, and doing a very sort of formal, I guess, theoretical evaluation of various approaches to evaluation. Um, so, yeah, but for you, Hugh, what was the incentive for you to get involved and, and evaluate and what's evaluation to you and why is it important? Well, there's, there's, there's a whole variety of, of reasons. One is to internally to check what you're doing. Um, the world keeps changing and unless organisations keep changing in, in line with the world, then we uh, you lose place. So actually evaluating where you are, what the impact on the clients are for your own internal purposes so that you can, you can learn and move forward uh, uh, is vital. Uh, possibly uh, the most important for third sector organisations is to be able to show the value of their work in relation to funding. Um, uh, unless we get funding, we don't exist. Um, and that funding might come from statutory agencies, um, a, a small grants, large grants, uh, contracts, whatever. And to get all that, we, we have to be able to show the what you know the value of what we bring uh, to the community and to the clients and to the potential funders. Um, in terms of academics, uh, it's an interesting challenge dealing with academics because they have their own agenda. They and Francesca coming in to do her PhD, she is focused on the PhD, not focused on helping us um, uh, principally. Uh, and she's uh, uh, sitting there with coming in with a different view of the world. Um, and that's actually quite interesting. And I don't think anybody should be worried about getting involved with academia. Uh, but as I say, they have their own agenda. We found it uh, enlightening because this was a, a, a different way of thinking coming into our organisation. Um, uh, with a different perspective. And, and at the end of it, it gave us confidence. It didn't mean necessarily that Francesca didn't find fault with what, what we were doing, but it gave us confidence that we were moving forward in the right direction. Um, uh, so I don't think any third sector organisation should be afraid of coming in and dealing with academia. The worry for a third sector organisation would be if they said, no, we don't want to be. Why would that be? Because even if you're learning that some of the things you're doing is not taking you to the right places, that's the learning so that you can learn from that and, and, and change what you do. Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and that challenge and learning is is. Uh... A key aspect I think so uh, let's go to you Francesca because Hugh, Hugh sort of mentioned a couple of things there um, about how the academic and practitioner perspective can be different so talk us through how you did how you did what you did Francesca with Hugh and, and what the impetus was from your your perspective. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, to give you like a bit of an idea of what kind of research I did with LC options, uh, uh, I uh, conducted what is called a realist evaluation uh, that included one part of qualitative methods, so longitudinal interviews, so interviewing uh, beneficiaries of LC options uh, several times uh, across uh, the, their participation in the intervention and beneficiaries of a comparator organization, so uh, people that they were having uh, uh, a similar intervention provided uh, by a different organization in some similar area than the one 
of Oban. I also collected some health outcomes. So when I spoke with people, I extracted, I asked some of their health outcomes, as well as I was able to extract some of their data from the GP data sets. And so that was more the quantitative part in terms of uh, impact. So I think it's very interesting to uh, understand what kind of link that that could be between academia and practice. Uh, and uh, um, in our discussion with you uh, several times, I mean, we discuss about the different kind of language and how, and I think it's very important to understand how actually we can match that language uh, to create like a real impact on uh, the practitioners and so this is a critic from the academic perspective that sometimes i mean uh, our language is more related to an academic uh, kind of audience instead of uh, having a practice kind of audience so i think that should be something very important to take in consideration in all our research of, of academics i presented the data um, to Hugh and colleagues after the data collection. I shared uh, the papers that they were published. And so, uh, but uh, there should be like, uh, we should think together about uh, creating that kind of link. And this is important as well, if we want to work together to get some funding uh, to create services and intervention, and for example, uh, apply to EU funding as we were discussing. Yeah. So creating that mix of language, I think it will be very important. Yeah, I, I think, Daniel, the the relationship is important. So that, that uh, and Francesca's talking about the language used. I, quite often, if I read a, an academic paper and I've read Francesca's reports and whatnot, and I'm thinking, what does this mean? So to a certain extent, a, 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 you, one has to have the confidence to say to Francesca, you know, Talk, talk to me in a different language. Let's translate this into language that the people that I deal with and the clients that I deal with can understand and, and similarly going the other way. So language and understanding, but that's, that's dependent on actually establishing relationships. Uh, and I think in evaluation, the relationships, uh, whether it be with funders or uh, other organisations, uh, starts to become very important. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that leads on to the question I was going to ask in, in follow up to that, which was um, so obviously we produce these reports and Francesca mentioned, you know, the realist evaluation that she did. What from your perspective, Hugh, what did you find? What was useful from that for you that you could that you could use? Mm. We learned that what we were doing uh, was comparable and better than uh, the, uh, the, the other organisations that uh, Francesca uh, also, as I say, it gave us confidence in what we were doing was right. It gave us new networks. Uh, we still communicate with the uh, Cam Donaldson and his staff. Uh, so it widened our network. Uh, it gave us confidence uh, and it gave us also the ability to indicate to potential funders that here was as a small organization had been part of this PhD. So it, it broadened, if you like, the scope of people that we could communicate with. Yeah, yeah. So and uh, in, in, I guess, sort of uh, contrast, Francesca, same question to you. What, what did you find from doing the work? I mean, I, I, I love I love doing my PhD. I love that as well, waking up at five o'clock, taking the train from Glasgow up to Oban. I will never forget like the fox in George Square in Glasgow at five o'clock winter time in Glasgow. So it means really cold, really dark. So, I mean, I really enjoyed doing my PhD, having the opportunity to work with a community based organization. It was, I mean, reflecting on my work on an organization that it was not a big established charity but a small community organization very embedded in this town i think it was something very valuable across all the parts so i had the opportunity to spend uh, uh, two times uh, like uh, an entire week uh, with one or their fitness manager following her uh, around uh, all the time and i think it was incredible to see 
like personally incredible to see like the relation that was established from the first meeting with the GP with the people. So it was I I mean in terms of professional experience was great because I was able to speak with a lot of people, collect a lot of data, and reflect. But also from my uh, I mean my personal experience, it was great also to see how a community as urban, trying different ways to solve some of the issues. So there are quite a lot of uh, non-profit organizations in urban that try to solve uh, different issues that the community has. And uh, so that was really also very interesting from my personal perspective. Yeah, and one of the interesting things there, I would say, is that you, you haven't really spoken, perhaps the way I phrase the question, but you haven't really spoken much about the formal aspects of doing your PhD and linking into theory and all that kind of stuff. It was more the process and and sort of, I guess, more human aspects of doing the research. Um, so, yeah, Hugh, did you want to come back in? Yeah, it just uh, uh, when Francesca is talking about uh, the, the, the community and whatnot, when I mentioned that I we did work on for Carnegie UK Trust, and as part of that, we, we did a, a study a, across to an organization in America. And one of the things that we learned, which gave us great confidence in uh, trying to start this, uh, and the phrase, it's always on, if I were to do a presentation, this phrase is always on slides. If the problem's in the community, the solution's in the community. And I love saying that in front of people from government and local authorities and whatnot, because that's where the problems are going to be solved. Uh, and I think what comes across when you deal with uh, things happening in the community uh, and community organisations, what you get is the fool. And I think Francesca hasn't necessarily used the word, but what she, I think, discovered was the passion that goes in to community work which can't, can't be replicated by the agencies, the statutory agencies and whatnot. And I think that's what separates a, a community organisations working for the people in the community uh, from the agencies and, and, and whatnot that are out with the community or have a, got a larger agenda. Mm, yeah, so do you see that those aspects as part of evaluation or, or do you, I mean, how, do, how do you approach it who 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 is it I mentioned you mentioned funders earlier on as, as who it's for but it sounds a lot there like as well it's for the community so they can evidence the fact that you know that they can be they can be the solution um so yeah how, how do you go about doing that and have you found a have you found a way to do it the answer to that is no <laughs> Uh, I don't think there is an answer to the evaluation. I think uh, it is a very difficult topic um, because a lot of the funders you don't necessarily have a relationship with, you apply. Um, and one of the issues I think for in terms of applying is how do you get across in words the, the passion uh, and the experience that clients have within you know, that come to your organisation. Uh, and that's very difficult. And I think perhaps if we go to the end of the, the, the this session, uh, we might be talking about post-COVID because one of the things that we've, we've actually learned is to be able to do this form of communication. Uh, we've always found that people coming, and, and whether it's a national clinical director or uh, the local GP or whatever, somebody coming to a, to see our work never goes away other than enthused and impressed. Uh, but how do you get that into down on paper? But mm. this sort of media means that we maybe don't have to get somebody from Edinburgh to come to Oban uh, to see our work. Maybe we can translate our work to them uh, electronically. Uh, and that's something that I think we need to explore. But because of COVID, we've actually developed the techniques uh, we've had to, to, to uh, you know, to engage with the clients through the whole of co the two years of COVID. We, we've had to develop our systems and whatnot. So it, to a certain extent, I think what I'm saying is that every time there's a problem, there's an opportunity and, and we need to think, well, how do we take that opportunity and, and move forward? Mm, yeah, yeah. And I'll just ask you one more question and come 
to Francesca for her reflections on it. But so if we you know, we, we talk about the you know the experiences and um, the, the you know the way that those services are delivered as being difficult to evaluate, what is it that you have evaluated in the past? When I think back, when I think back to the beginning, we didn't do enough evaluation. Uh, and we didn't know really what to evaluate. You, you, you're, you're going forward, and we didn't spend enough time uh, looking at evaluation. Uh, so, and that caused us problems because the first two years, you're you're actually desperate to get in, engaged with clients and do the work, and you weren't thinking about uh, the um, the evaluation. But at the end of the two years, you've got to apply for different money, more money. Uh, and how do you do that when you haven't evaluated? So I think uh, in starting an organisation, if, if you went back to do it again, you'd think, well, let's just measure four simple things, three or four things that we might, we might be able to track um, uh, so that we've got something. It might not necessarily be exactly what the funder might want, but at least we've made the effort to go and get information that consolidates uh, and uh, shows some value of what we've been doing. Uh, dealing with statutory agencies where we're hoping to get money uh, is a very difficult one. Um, they love stories. Come along and they'll listen to stories and be very impressed by people's stories. So you can either tell stories or you can do with numbers. And our experience with statutory agencies, they love the stories, but you don't get money without the numbers. Um, and, uh, uh, and I don't think there is enough relationships developed. Uh, if somebody wants to give you a thousand pounds, you know, the, we're not talking about developing a long relationship, but if somebody's going to give you 15, 10, 15,000 a year for three years, we really, should be developing relationships with that organisation. And that's partly on their side as well. Uh, to a certain extent, they probably view that they are helping us to achieve our objectives. But I think from the, the uh, grantees' uh, uh, point of view, we're actually helping them to achieve their objectives as well. Um, so there should be much more. And I think that perhaps again out of COVID, where everybody said to prove to be more flexible, we can actually learn from some of that. Yeah, great. So I guess then the challenge to throw to you, Francesca, and perhaps the one that you've, you uh, encountered while you were doing the work is, what is the answer to some of those things that Hugh's just raised? You know, we're, we're the academics. What, what, what can we turn around and say, this is the way you should be doing it, or this is what you should be focusing on for your evaluation? That is a tricky question in the sense that my, the starting point of my PhD was trying to understand how to adapt some of the evaluation that are used in health intervention. I'm talking about medicine, but I'm talking as well about a very focused health intervention that used different kind of methods that are detailed, for example, in the Medical Research Council guidelines in the UK, how to use them for a different kind of organization that are smaller in terms. So that was the starting point, the ending point uh, uh, on my PhD is, uh, and the reflection that I did, uh, I think uh, first, uh, I mean, and this is for the public sector and the policy makers to, to understand is that it's not possible to apply one size fits all evaluation to all the organization that they have or that they found because context and the mechanism related to that context really change and uh, so it's not possible to think about evaluating two different stuff that are completely different in context or as well to scale or replicate in different area uh, different inter uh, like similar intervention if the context is different so first of all context is a very important second i think that uh, the kind of evaluation depends really on the objective of the evaluation self so if the organization is evaluating uh, uh, for a strategic reason, so an internal reason, some methods can be used, but uh, if the reason is uh, for informing policymakers and funding, I don't think that the burden should be on the community organization, so it should be academics research center to provide that kind of uh, 
evaluation for policy makers because it's time consuming, uh, it's resource consuming, uh, and it would divert a part of the funding and the people of the organization from their work. And I don't think that should be uh, on the organization. So these are uh, two of the learnings among others uh, from my PhD that I think would be very useful for policymakers if they want to have really evidence-based policy or evidence-based funding intervention. So mm. how, do you, how do you feel about that, Hugh? Yeah, I think that's right. I think a, the difficulty most organize, small organizations will have is how much time, which means money as well, how much time and money do you put into this? And what is the expectation? If I'm talking to, let's say, a government minister, he can hardly expect an organisation with a turnover of 200,000 to come away with earth-shattering results. Uh, 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 you know, most medical and scientific research is done on large numbers uh, uh, studies. No, no small organisation can do that. So you're actually looking for trends, you're looking for... Uh, uh, you know, small amounts of evidence, uh, but if the if the small amount of evidence is there, then that's where I think academia and uh, the organisations need to work together, and that and that involves I think government and policy, um, and to a certain extent, there perhaps need to be a, a, some form of communication between uh, academia to, to help small organisations understand where the policy direction is going uh, so that they can actually work towards that policy. Because there is a huge, I don't know uh, anything else other than in Scotland, but policy in Scotland, I would say, is excellent. I can read all the policy stuff and think this is going directly our way and we are doing what, exactly what the policy says, but somewhere between the writing of the policy and the delivery, uh, uh, the, whatever number of channels there are there, it all dissipates. So small community organisations can be actually doing the work of the policy, but actually the communication of that is actually quite difficult. Mm, yeah, and that, that touches as well, those differences touch on uh, the point that Francesca made a moment ago about how um, there are you know, these different requirements of evaluation and different aspects of evaluation, you know, whether it's internal improvement aspects or whether it is, you know, external um, evidence in policy initiatives and things like that. Um, so I guess a, qu a question which perhaps we might know the answer to from what you, you were sort of saying in the intro um, is what aspects of the work that you did with Francesca were ended up being important to your organisation? Confidence, I would say, uh, realizing that what we were doing had been examined and by academia and not found to be failing. Uh, so that gave us confidence that we were we were working in the right direction, um, uh, and it had value. Our work had value, if you like, beyond the remit of open. Um, and, and just what, you know, the, the, the confines of where we were as a small organisation, we could see this, this has, what we're doing has significance. Uh, so that gave us confidence uh, to, and to was, was that to move forward. Yeah, was that beyond whether the, the evaluation itself was positive or negative? Was it, was it sort of an attachment to the robustness and the validity of, of the process rather than necessarily the outcomes of it? Yes. Or was it both? Right. OK. Yeah. Because you mentioned earlier that actually sometimes one of the important things is to be open to challenge for, for yeah. evaluation. Um, and yeah. so obviously the robustness still, the validity still applies, whether it's positive or negative feedback. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, to, to a certain extent, positive feedback uh, uh, is, is, is good to hear. Negative feedback is the important side of things. Yeah, because it's from the negative side. You think, well, we maybe, maybe we're not doing this quite as much or, or the impact we think we're getting one impact and we're not actually uh, any different from anybody else, whereas we, we might have thought we were. So actually getting a feedback which you can possibly, as a learning organisation, as a developing organisation, sometimes it's a negative stuff, 
that gives you the more, most uh, uh, impetus. Yeah, thanks. And so, Francesca, then, from your perspective, from the academic perspective, for the work that you did with Hugh, what was what was the important stuff to you? Um, and I mean that perhaps in in a slightly more instrumental way in terms of the the academic world. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I the instrumental part. I would talk only about this, but I mean, there is. I was saying uh, like all the personal part. So in terms of instrumental part, I can think about two, two two uh, important uh, uh, reasons. One is uh, like it launched a bit the idea I have in terms of uh, uh, how to conduct the future of research as well after COVID-19. So I moved a bit from uh, evaluating community-based organization towards evaluating social innovation, understood as uh, uh, intervention uh, managed and coordinated and co-created by, dif by different actors. Um, so that in instrumental way, my PhD was the starting point of this kind of process and paths. So for the next years, uh, I'm looking, I'm looking for uh, finding funds, uh, uh, funds and money to undertake research that can explore the impact of social innovation intended as a relation among different actors in addressing health inequalities. And I start in this path with a, a collection of secondary data, so a systematic literature review about social innovation during COVID-19. Uh, and it comes out with some mechanism that I would like to test. So this is one, so launching a research stream, a research idea, reflecting on this topic is one. And the second one, more pragmatic uh, uh, and short term in that moment, it was uh, undertaking my PhD and being able to publishing uh, for uh, uh, continuous paths uh, as an academic career. So that there is also this part. And that it opens other like point of contrast for academics uh, because it's not always very easy to publish an evaluation because sometimes uh, you have to rethink about the theoretical contribution that there is behind that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, and that, that's, that's you know, re really good observation there. The, 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 the requirements of the academic world are uh, yeah, always there, aren't they, with, with any of this work. So um, we're getting, getting close to sort of the end of this, this section of, of the day, and I'll, I'll guess wrap things up by asking, um, a, a, a two-pronged question. So, so what you feel the legacy of the work that you did together was, and then what you would like to do in the future. So, we'll go go to you first, Hugh. So, the legacy of the work that you did with Francesca, and then what what's next? What's in the future? Well, I think that the 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 legacy is, a, 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 you know, again, a confidence, a increased network, uh, networking uh, opened several doors for us. Um, that uh, have proved valuable uh, as we, we go forward. We uh, through that, uh, that that relationship, we we've had discussions with government ministers and uh, senior people in the medical side of things uh, uh, in, within Scotland. So that side of it, I think going forward, I, I see the, the the ability to be more flexible within as an organisation to see other people having to be flexible. I, I think uh, from this, we should be looking at uh, developing m more relationships uh, with each other, whether with the academia, whether it be with funders and with small organisations, always bearing in mind the very limited resource that small organisations have. Mm. Uh, you know, we, our development manager, for example, could be going to seminars and talking and learning a, you know, three or four days a week, because this is, you know, getting things done in the community is a, a huge area, but you can't afford possibly to do that. So to a certain extent, I would like to think that the funders and the agencies will move towards us rather than expecting us to always to, to uh, mm. feed into them. Yeah, great. Thanks, you. So, just to wrap things up, Francesca, what, what do you think was the legacy from your your point of view, and what what do you hope to have left behind by doing the the work, and then, um, and maybe provided for the organisation through working with them? Yeah, I think that um, the legacy personally was uh, like all the learning paths and the process, and what I learned during that process, and I used uh, similar methods or uh, similar. 
more the methods, methodological approaches and reflection, philosophical reflection on realism in uh, evaluating other organizations, providing different uh, kind of intervention for different beneficiaries. Uh, so that's uh, the learning paths uh, and the legacy. I think it's the idea that there is the possibility of uh, working together with practitioners to uh, undertake research projects uh, that can support them, uh, but as well policymakers in terms of evidence. And I hope and I'm happy to hear that, I mean, that my research was useful in terms of impact uh, for supporting uh, LC options to have that kind of relation or as well like to show one paper and say, look, we did this and mm. this gave us the confidence, but as well, we can promote our organization with this kind of publication. Yeah, excellent. That, that's a great place to a very positive place to uh, to finish this this section of the day. Then I think uh, let me just go back to the slides and we will. Um, one second, find out where we are exactly. So we had the discussion and what we're going to do is now go into our uh, breakout group. So we have um, three questions in the groups that you'll see when we get there. And, and we, we kick things off with why, why you're here today, you know, as, as, a, as an attendee, what your interest is. Uh, any potential challenges that you face and, and, and any potential solutions. We'll have two groups. I'll be in room one, Francesca and Hugh will be in room two. And we've got some links there to uh, what's called Padlet, which is a, a sort of a, a message board for you to put your type your answers in as well. But you'll also be able to uh, to speak in the groups. So we'll make a start now and we'll aim. We're running slightly behind. So we'll aim for um, coming back into the main room at 20 past 11 so it gives us 10 minutes for a bit of q a and feedback before we um before we wrap up at half past so heidi will uh, assign us all momentarily there'll be a slight delay just as we as the as team microsoft teams assigns us all to the groups but see you on the other side yeah so this final part of the of the the day is just really just to wrap up um it's an opportunity for you to ask any questions that might have come into your head through the breakout groups that you'd like to introduce into the, the wider group for discussion um or people who were in say in the group that i was in to, to ask questions uh, of, of hugh and francesca as well specifically um if anyone wants to kick us off uh, for, you can also type in the chat chat box as well if you'd prefer to do it that way if anyone wants to kick us off, I'll leave a, a short moment of pause to do that. If not, I'll, I'll come to Hugh and Francesca for a bit of a summary of, of their group. If anyone's got a burning question, feel free to jump in now. OK, I'll take that as a no. So Francesca, give us a uh, give us a summary of, of your discussion. Yeah, so uh, I think we touch on, upon a bit the challenges that we faced, uh, both as academics as, and as practitioner during COVID-19, and so the difficulties as well of uh, uh, losing a bit uh, the human interaction. And But on the other side, how to think about the future, so in terms of solution and long-term solution, how to think how academics, practitioners, uh, and funders should work together to address uh, some of the problems that we can find in the society and how to match that kind of narrative and languages. So the organization, the organization found uh, quite uh, uh, useful uh, uh, work with academics uh, and the academics uh, can uh, like uh, create something that is useful for the organization, but as well in terms of solving the issues, uh, so useful for policymakers uh, and funders. So I don't know if you would like to add something more. Oh, you muted there, Hugh. No, that's a, that a, that's fine, Francesca. I think we maybe need to move on to Daniel's. Right. Yeah. Sure. Well, um, I think that the main thing from from our group that we ended up talking about in particular was. Um, the, the practical difficulties that can be faced, Gerard raised, um, uh, responding to Christine's point on the Padlet, um, that, that t oftentimes it can be difficult to get staff to um, feed into the evaluation that you want to do or to get the, the pure practicality of getting them to fill in a sheet, a, you know, a feedback sheet or to get them to record on, a, um, you know, a, um, uh, on the computer system uh, database or whatever. The interactions that they've had with clients in order to build that that evaluation data. So we, we spoke quite a bit about that. Um, 
and that's I think that's an important thing to consider as well from the perspective of and I do it myself often I think okay as an academic we'll work with a practitioner and that practitioner is sort of representative of their organization and then they they are responsible for disseminating this information out to their organization as a whole but that's a really really difficult thing to do um, and to be a champion for something within your organization is an extra emotional um, physical at times burden uh, which can be quite tiring um, I know myself having sort of experienced it so yeah we spoke about that as well and 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 how um, can be uh, challenges of getting people to do that uh, we spoke about the potential for working with others as sort of co-researchers peer researchers which often we do in academia uh, a little bit as well so yeah there was really really sort of practical challenges with that which which focused a lot on both the internal evaluation for organizations themselves like quality control stuff but also external things for funders so yeah I don't know if you had any reflections on that one Francesca from your experience I mean uh, it was raised a kind of similar uh, point uh, uh, inside our room about uh, the difficulty sometimes of uh, yes I mean I, I, I had difficulties as well it's true that I, I um, I was the one recruiting participants, so I, I, I follow up one of the fitness manager for one period of time, but afterwards I just sit in the coffee break uh, in the gym and uh, uh, they told me who were the participants and the beneficiaries and I went there and I recruited them and that was quite challenging. And uh, I think it's more challenging when you work with uh, younger people. So elderly people, I mean, they were very happy to have a chat or to become involved. Uh, it was more challenging to have a retention. So uh, I interviewed them for three times in six months. So the third time, uh, of course, there was a decreasing. So that could be that could be a challenge. So, I mean, mm -hmm. my suggestion is to really recall people several times. Uh, and as well, when you work with vulnerable people uh, such for example doing research i do a lot of research with asylum seekers and migrants uh, and two way of recruiting people uh, uh, one is uh, uh, involving uh, peer researchers uh, so for example involving uh, asylum uh, refugees more than asylum seeker but this is for the uk law but uh, uh, refugees in uh, doing uh, some of the interviews uh, as well as, for example, I used to volunteer uh, disclosed, so saying that I was doing research in a community organization providing services uh, for migrants. And so I become friends of the people that uh, I interviewed. So mm. that are the two that, points, possible really, suggestion. Yeah, two really good points then. A challenge for academics, I think, to get more involved in with the organizations that we want to research, you know, whether it's volunteers or, or contributors and certainly something that's something that I, I myself was, have, have sort of done as well as a research approach. Um, yeah, uh, Hugh, uh, any reflections on on that from your experiences? We muted, muted again. Hugh, Hugh mute, you're muted. muted. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, academia has a, a, a potential a facilitator role uh, so that it has to come from uh, small organisations will not make the initiatives because they don't have enough time to do that. So academia re needs to reach out. Um, I think I, I, I th think there needs to be more work done between funders and practitioners. I think that, that we probably don't have enough understanding uh, of each other uh, uh, and, and the challenges that each face. Uh, and I think there's academia has a role there. I think the, the, in your session, Daniel, uh, how do you get your staff to provide you with the information uh, uh, for the uh, we have tried, I wouldn't necessarily say we're 100% successful, but everybody in our organisation knows that we are dependent on getting funding. And the only way we can get funding is 
by producing evidence. So this is not just something filling in a form or whatnot. It's not just something that is management have decided that you need to do. It's actually necessary for you to have a job the next year. And that puts it maybe into focus. I'm not necessarily saying that in a nasty way, but somehow a, a, I think it's about communication with staff and, 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 and trying to explain the importance of what you're doing. Because if it's not important, why are we doing it? And so I think there's a there's a communication has to be worked and, and reinforced. It's not just a matter of saying it once and whatnot, but because some staff lapse and we need to pull them, and it's happened in our organisation, we need to pull them back in. But mm. it's, it's a communication issue. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that, that came up, Gerald mentioned that in, in our group as well, the communication aspect. So we're, we're bang on half 11. So we'll we'll draw to a close. Um, couple of couple of final things to mention uh, you can um, access some of Francesca's work there through the references that are listed on this slide and we'll, we'll make sure you get the this information as well um, including um, the the sort of two different outputs I guess from that uh, one is an academic paper and one's a, a blog that you you uh, could yeah might really really be interested in sorry two academic papers there aren't there there's also the link to law and healthy options a huge huge organization and again, the link to the CVSL site, and you can contact us via email as well. Um, I mentioned the date of the next CVSL conference, um, which is the 9th of June this year, and you can also still sign up to the newsletter through the evaluation form that Heidi has just put in the chat again. So, um, yeah, so that <coughs> is the end of the session. Thanks so much for attending, and a massive thanks to Hugh for being involved as well, and Francesca for for uh, for all your contributions and, and may pretty much being the brains behind the operation I would, I would say and massive thanks to Heidi as well for organizing and everything and hopefully see you all at um, the next CVSL event and particularly at our conference in June.